Okay, welcome everybody. I will, would like to thank you to Diana, Selena, Federico and all the people from BTS this uh, invitation because for me it's a nice opportunity to share with colleagues a little bit of information, clinical information about how we use uh, gauge analysis for decision making in, in Spain. Since 2007, uh, I was working in uh, Niño Jesus Pediatric Hospital with uh, CP children and in this time we share uh, with orthopedic surgeons, uh, rehab doctors, neurologists, neurosurgeons and all the people involved in therapy, physical therapists, occupational therapists and neuropsychologists and all the people involved, the parents and whatever. We share a lot of information, a lot of biomechanical information. In the very beginning, uh, we miss a lot of data and in the very beginning we have a lot of pitfalls. So, let me talk about uh, this lecture uh, like a film. Uh, so, the, the company is Italian, so I take the good, the bad and the ugly uh, for, uh, for the title of this lecture. I know I am the good Maybe uh, in the past uh, I met with the bad and I hope I never be the ugly. So uh, now it's time for starting. Uh, the film starts with the ugly and I'm going to start with the ugly. Let me introduce uh, the data of the prevalence of obesity in CP children in the States. This data is from 2007, the same year I started working in uh, Niño Jesus uh, Pediatric Hospital. As you can see in the slide, there is an increase of uh, obesity in CP children. It's something that we are, if we look at the, at the patients now, we see these numbers in our population. So for me, it's something uh, critical to look at the patient as a whole picture, never forget the details. And this is the athlete. This, if you forget the details, you have problems. Uh, Ruben is the first patient I would like to introduce. Ruben come to our gate lab with two motor disorders. The first one is obesity, the second one is cerebral palsy. We look into detail at the kinematics, kinetics and all the clinical examination, but we didn't take care of the obesity. Let me show you why we uh, start uh, doing uh, therapy with uh, Ruben. I hope all the videos work. Uh, Ruben comes to our gate lab. He is uh, uh, seven years, eight, sorry, eight years old. And uh, we look in the clinical examination and we uh, check that there is an increase of uh, femoral antiversion, an inflection contracture, flat foot deformity, and uh, and. If you look into the, the GMFM, we miss 25%. Uh, uh, so you have a lot of functional impairments, uh, and you have a lot of problems, and you need to uh, do something with uh, Ruben because he, if you allow to Ruben growing with this orthopedic uh, uh, or this liver arm dysfunctions, he's going to go to crouch and he's going to miss the gait. Uh, that's why our surgeons uh, tell us that why won't why don't you uh, don't why don't we do uh, uh, orthopedic surgery? Single level multi level surgery was performed in 2007. They do uh, knee extension osteotomies for uh, uh, knee flexion contractors. They perform a little bit of rotation osteotomies, adding to the extensor osteotomies of the femur. Uh, at the distal uh, part, they do uh, intrapelvic psoas lengthening, and for the distal part uh, and, uh, and uh, talonavicular arthrodesis and uh, derotation osteotomies were performed. The main problem is that our patient has no rehab process before the, the surgery, and this is the problem. This is the main problem. We do the surgery with the um, using kinematics and kinetics, but we have no rehab. And this is the ugly, the ugly situation because when you check the results 12 months before the surgery, you have poor, really poor results. Let me show you the video. Here it is. 
This is Ruben in 2008, one year postdoc. You missed the gate. He's obese and he has a lot of uh, problems for walking. He needs two assistants for uh, some steps. He needs uh, uh, something like a KAFO for walking. So our results are really, really poor from a real point of view. This is not good for the patient. And the main problem is that you miss that he is obese and he needs rehab. So the conclusions of the, the ugly patient is not related to the patient, it's related to the situation. So the, the conclusion of the ugly is that you need to take care of everything. Please look at the patient as a whole picture and don't uh, spend uh, all the time looking at the data. This is the first message for taking to home. You need everything. If you do a nice uh, rehabilitation program, we perform an intensive uh, training, uh, st intensive strengthening program uh, for 20 weeks uh, based in, uh, in muscle strengthening, something specific with whole body vibration, bicycle, more than two hours every day, five days a week and we add it to the conventional program of physical therapy and a, re a gate re-education uh, program, 30 minutes every, every uh, five days a week. We have all the, re uh, we, we change the, the, the results. We change how Ruben walks, but our results are not pretty good because we miss the, the time for doing the treatment in the right way. So. For sure, Ruben is going to walk again, as you see in the, in the screen. But this is a similar pretty situation that we see in the past. So he's walking with crutches, he's a little bit, the, the knees are straight, the, the toes are looking at the, in, in the right way in the frontal plane, but he's walking with crutches in slow, something like a slow motion. So we didn't perform the change. We, would like to offer to this patient. The message is you need to take uh, care of everything and the second thing to take in mind is you need to take, uh, care, of, uh, take care of everything and do the things in the time that are uh, explained. If you like uh, the cinema and I love it, uh, let the force be with you is the message from uh, Darth Vader or from people from Star Wars. And the only way for uh, doing these kind of things is keep the patient doing physical therapy. I know that there is not a lot, uh, a lot of uh, evidence-based reviews about, uh, about uh, physical therapy in cerebral palsy, but I think it's the only way to keep the children active or as, as, as active as they need. The second case is the, the, the bar. Let me introduce Alba. Alba in 2008 it comes to visit us because she receives uh, uh, botulinum toxin injections with poor results. I think it becomes really popular in Spain to use uh, botulinum toxin uh, from 2004 and, and the, the main thing that we have in the data of uh, uh, ALBA is if you look at, the, at this data, you have uh, the initial contact in plantar flexion, here, you have the initial contact in plantar flexion. So this information added to the information of uh, the clinical examination, she has uh, a spasticity in the triceps, moves the clinician to um, put some Botox in, uh, in, in the triceps. These are the results of uh, uh, a post-intervention um, uh, study, and as you can see, there is no plant flexion uh, at the uh, terminal uh, stance. There is no flexion, and there is no flexion at the knee, and there is no flexion at the at the hip. So the patient has a problem related to botulinum toxin because if you look into in, into the surface EMG, there is no activity of uh, uh, gastrocnemius during stance phase. And of course, there is no activity 
during the, the terminal stance. And if we look into detail to the data, you have a, a, a silence, an electromyographic uh, silence in the terminal uh, swing. So maybe the initial contact is not related to spasticity and it could be related to a poor motor control or maybe to weakness. I'm sure that it could be poor motor control. But if I show you the video of, uh, of Alba walking, you can see, okay, she's not going to wear orthosis or something like this because this is the next uh, thing we add to, to, to the patient. We say, okay, why don't you try to walk with uh, AF, an AFO or something like this? And the patient say, okay, I'm not going to wear AFOs because I'm younger, I'm thinner, I'm a beautiful lady, and I don't want AFOs. Let's check how what happens in the in the in the in the swing phase during the swing phase. But there is not enough uh, plant. Uh, there is not enough dorsiflexion. There is not enough flexion of the knee. There is not enough flexion of the of the hip. But this problem cannot be solved using botulinum toxin. This problem needs muscle strengthening and physical therapy if you want, but never botulinum toxin injections. And that's why we offer this new thing to, uh, to Alba. So here we are with our data and our message. Please don't, do, don't put petroleum toxin in gastro if you are not sure with the data in your hand. We perform clinical gait analysis and sorry but I think it's not uh, well seen in the screen but here you have the same image with the drop foot in the in the um, sagittal plane, the same image, inflection, a nice uh, hip uh, flexion at swing, and it is related to a strengthening program and eight, uh, with uh, a, dura a duration of eight weeks and two weeks of uh, wait and see. Look, there is a lot of power generation here is a normal generation power and this generation power uh, this power gen uh, generated at the ankle makes the, the knee flex and the hip flex and that's why the patient moves in the right way this is the way for making the, the uh, swing face looks better and not putting some Botox in, in, the, in the triceps let me show you the results here we are so if you look into the video, you have an increased peak knee flexion, then you will see an increased uh, hip knee flexion, but the, the, the foot is still in plantar flexion. So the butt is related to what you cannot do if you not, don't look at the data. You take care of all the details, but if you miss something in the data, you could do something wrong. Now, it's time for good results. It's time for the cases that I love. These cases where you find uh, a solution in gait analysis. I'm not going to show you x-rays or whatever. For sure, it's necessary for decision making, x-rays, clinical examination, uh, Anemias is everything. You, you need everything. Miguel is uh, a young child of 12 years old with the spastic uh, uh, cerebral palsy uh, 2 with GMFM 66 and pain in both knees. This is the, the, the thing that uh, was, uh, the, these are the, the complaints that the family tell us. He is in pain, he has a gross motor level 2, and the patient says, I want to go out with my friends because I love one of my uh, friends and I would like to um, do, I, I, will, I want to conquer the, the heart of my colleague, but my gait pattern makes me feel uncomfortable. This is the complaints of the patient. But the complaints that you see in the graphs are completely different. This is a severe crouch gait pattern. And it's a strong, more than 40 degrees of knee flexion at the, at the knee 
in the in the clinical examination. More than 40 degrees, so terrible. A uh, little bit of asymmetry, knee flexion, hip flexion, and something in the pelvic. Let's check a little bit what we look into the graphs. The first thing is that if you know the protocol that is uh, used in this uh, patient, we use uh, Davis protocol. So there is something wrong here because you see there's a lot of uh, uh, dorsiflexion in the right side and a normalized dorsiflexion in mid, in mid stance in the, in the left side. And it doesn't fit with the clinical examination because we see a lot of dorsiflexion in both, in both uh, feet or in both ankles. The problem is that uh, Davis model considered that the foot is only one segment and Miguel has a deformity, a midfoot break deformity where the, um, the calcaneus is in equinus and the midfoot is in excessive dorsiflexion. So this is what you see here, a decreased range of motion and uh, something that looks pretty similar to a normal dorsiflexion in mid stance. And increase, really increase uh, dorsiflexion of the, of the right side. And it is related to the combination of uh, movement of uh, the ankle and the, and the midfoot. But there is no decrease in the range of motion. So it's pretty good. This range of motion is pretty good. If you go to the knee, there is a severe flexion uh, crouch gate pattern, severe flexion of the knee. Suspect with these graphs that there is a, a real contracture at the, at, the, at the knee. If you look uh, at the hip, there is a poor extension in mid stance. It's not, no, it's not possible to find extension, but the movement is a little bit conserved little bit conserved. So you see flexion extension pattern. Here you, you can see flexion extension pattern and here you see a little bit of flexion extension pattern. So maybe there is, or for sure, there is a, a, flex, a hip flexion contracture, but there is enough power in the extensors of the hip to move the, the hip to extension in mid stance a little bit with an excessive uh, knee flexion. In the frontal plane, we see an excessive adduction of the left side and in the transversal plane and a little bit of uh, hip internal rotation. Due to this crosstalk uh, that you can see in the frontal plane of the knee, uh, our team considered not to do, don't do, didn't do anything at the, at the transversal plane because uh, when you see these graphs uh, with a lot of barus bulbus, the, the knee flexion axis is not well calculated. So maybe you can have a crosstalk in the, in the transversal plane. So it's a detail to take into consideration. If you see a lot of movement here, you need to take care in the transversal plane when you are inter interpreting the data. That's why we move in this direction. The treatment plan was to perform, for sure, we take x-rays and all the clinical uh, tests that we used to do. The, the plan was to perform uh, uh, intrapelvic intra uh, uh, in, intra psoas lengthening for both hips, rectus femoris uh, um, lengthening at proximal uh, hip, knee extension osteotomy, and then the next question is, do you think we are going to perform something to the hamstrings? No, never. The hamstrings need to be preserved because the hamstrings are the main extensors of the hip and you have a normal pelvis. So if you, they, these hamstrings are not too short. So you need to preserve the strength of the hamstrings. So when you do the, or when the surgeon perform the knee extension osteotomy, he need to cut a little bit to do something like, like a uh, 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 hamstring lengthening. Instead of taking uh, 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 a small piece, you need to take a trapezius. So it's pretty similar to do a lengthening, but without losing uh, strength of the hamstrings. For the distal part, uh, the, the, the talus deformity is not 
well managed with uh, surgery and needs a lot of physical therapy, it could be managed with orthosis. And in the right side, we need to perform a Bauman procedure for uh, um, rare foot uh, um, uh, dorsal flexion because you remember that there is an equinus in the red foot in the left side. And for sure, we need to correct the, the problem of the midfoot. So a talon avicular arthrodesis was performed in, in this patient. Looking at the data, only kinematics, because I think it's, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with kinetics. But looking at, the, at this data, you have an objective quick and easy to define plan, but we don't know if this kind of approach could optimize the results of our patients. Let me show you, only uh, just for, for uh, uh, be sure that you keep in mind how Miguel works, the video of Miguel, okay, could you see, it's a severe, severe crouch gate pattern. Okay. okay, I put it again in mid stance. You can see this a lot of knee flexion, excessive dorsal flexion, hip flexion contractors. So this is the one of the main uh, things to keep in mind. The kin kinematics and kinetics fits with the pattern you look. So we have something that we uh, we, we fit we fit uh, we fix the clinical examination, the structure of the ICF model with the function and the participation. And when you fit everything, you can think that you are near to obtain good results. One year uh, later, Miguel, I hope you remember Miguel and, and because we see the video some minutes, uh, some seconds ago, has a nice knee extension in mid stance a nice movement at the ankle. We didn't perform anything for talus deformity of the right side, so there is no change in the right side. Swast lengthening allow us to uh, increase the range of motion, and there is a little bit of change in the pattern of the transversal plane. No change in the frontal plane, and Due to weakness, we see how Miguel moves the pelvis a lot. This is a compensation, a typical compensation. So one year post-op, with a lot of surgery and a lot of uh, physical therapy, we have an objective, quick, and easy way to measure how our patient improves. Let me show you the video of uh, Miguel again. So this is Miguel before the surgery. So you have good knee extension or pretty good knee extension. You have good extension of both hips. You have a nice alignment in the frontal plane, nice alignment in the transversal plane. Nice. So uh, the results to the people in the room. So this is Miguel just 12 months before the surgery. So it, it, it changes the decision making, it changes the way you look at the patient and it changes the results. Our expectations about Miguel are completely different from the first video to the second one. Our treatment will be completely different without gait analysis because you need gait analysis. But Miguel is a really, really obvious case of crouch gait. And this is something when you discuss with surgeons that could be a tricky thing. You do gait analysis, but I know what I can do with a, a severe crouch gait. I know that knee extension osteotomy is a good treatment and it changes the way you look at the patient because you, if you have a straight knee leg in, uh, in mid stance, all the victor change. So maybe it can add some information about uh, hip extension, but it's not critical for decision making. And that's why I take another good patient. Let me show you uh, the results of Juan. 
one is a patient from the north of Spain that comes to our gate lab with knee uh, pain, anterior knee pain. Uh, he's an spastic uh, diplegia, uh, GMFCS level 1. And if you look at the video, there is no severe flexion contractors. It's the main difference between Miguel and Juan. So these are the results previous to surgery. Here is uh, Miguel. It's not severe. As you can see in the video, I think it's not well, uh, it's difficult to, to see. I draw the patella because he has a really patella alta in the, in, 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 in the, in, in both, in both uh, knees. But he's not a severe crotch gate pattern. And we have a lot of uh, doubts with these patients. Do you think, and this is a question for the room, do you think knee extension osteotomy is required for this patient? So knee extension osteotomy plus patellar advancement is no less than uh, four hours of surgery. Uh, a surgeon cuts the femur and do an extension. It's an expensive procedure and it is not a safe procedure. There are a lot of uh, arteries uh, behind the knee, so it's really dangerous. So it's really necessary to perform knee extension osteotomy with this uh, patient. And I think the, the thing that to, we need to keep in mind is that it's really necessary to perform knee extension osteotomy with these grafts. And you say, yes, you have no extension at mid stance and a decrease in the range of motion. For sure, if you look into the uh, graph and you go to the knee, you, hit, you see a flexion of the knee and you see a little bit of internal rotation at, at both. But the main problem is that you have a normal uh, ankle without enough power generation, without plantar flexion uh, in uh, uh, plantar flexion during the, the terminal stance, but you have a lot of decrease in the range of motion. Knee extension is not possible due to patella alta. It's not due to pain. It's a mechanical disorder. If your lever arm is, uh, is uh, moved up, you have less power generation at the knee. And for sure, if you look at the GDI, you have a uh, an incredible, uh, you are really far from normal data. You are 70, 69.5, or 86 uh, in the right, uh, left side. So you are far from normal, and the future, the physics, will guide you to crouch. For sure, it's written in the literature, it's an evidence. I don't need uh, to explain that physics will lead you to flexion if you walk with flexion of your knees. It's something that you see with all the patients. For sure, if you have cerebral palsy, you could develop pain and contractors and severe bone, deformi bone deformities. Okay, this is, these are the results. Let me show it again, again, the knee. The knee moves to uh, extension in mid stance we miss a little bit of uh, flexion of uh, and the knee at uh, the swing phase, and it is related to muscle weakness at triceps. At the triceps, you have muscle weakness, and this is a problem. Without anything, without treatment, or for sure with the treatment of the of the knee, we increase the hip extension because there is no formal uh, contractors at the, at the hip. So you have flexion related to the flexion of the knees. He was looking for stability in stance, and that's why the patient flexed the hips. We didn't perform something or anything, sorry, for the transversal plane, and that's why you have internal rotation. And we didn't perform anything at the muscles of the, of the hip, so that's why the pelvis is moving in this, in this way. So if you look into the data, we correct the knee and we have good results at the knee. Knee extension osteotomy and patellar advancement.
That's all. These are the results for this patient. If the treatment is well planned, the GDI changes dramatically to a nice situation. Remember that the minimum detectable change that you need in GDI is five points. So we move from 70 to 89 is more than uh, than 10 points or 20 points. So we are in the nine, in the, the best situation uh, for this patient. And now from a physic point of view, I know that this patient could stay with a, with a knee extension for the, the rest of uh, his life. He has cerebral palsy, but uh, the, he's near the end of the, of the growth. So maybe we change the pattern and this pattern will change for the whole life. This is the ugly, the bad, and the good. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy a week for your questions. Okay.